Shabbat Shalom to you all. This is Bill. I'm coming to you live again this morning from the Biblical Lifestyle Center in Texas, Texas, USA. Thank you for joining with me and let me come into your living room and your, your car or your smartphone screen. However you connect with me this morning, it's such a pleasure to on this Sabbath morning, this beautiful day of holiness and blessing and rest and delight. Now we share some time together, share some space together, and begin to talk about holy things, wonderful things. Begin to reorient uh, to uh, to holiness and the beauty realm of the King, and to, to His ways and to His thoughts and to His His plan for the creation. So, good morning to you. Uh, if you're tuning in and you don't mind, drop me a note. Let me know your name uh, or at least your designation that you'd like to go by and uh, where you're located and anything you would like to say to me regarding uh, prayer requests, a praise report, uh, yeah, uh, just a comment, uh, anything you'd like, a question you might want to ask, anything like that. I didn't get to see you last week in this situation, but we, we had a beautiful, uh, another way to do things. We were celebrating, observing Shavuot, uh, the Feast of uh, Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. We had a, a discussion about that with my good friend Chauncey Tony Young, and if you want to view that, you can go to the Facebook page, my William Bullock or Bill Bullock Facebook page, and uh, I think you'll, you'll enjoy our uh, tour Talks conversation over Shavuot uh, that day. Uh, we talked about strategic alignment, and we'll talk a little bit more maybe about that today as we step forward back into the tour portions, back into the scheduled, sequenced, uh, obstacle course of life back into where we were and we left off. We left off at Parsha number 34, Bamidbar. We had just begun to study and discuss and live out of the book of Numbers. We have a whole new action sequence. Uh, the book of Leviticus was a book in which we were bombarded with wisdom and with beauty and with majesty and we spent the entire book in the presence of the Holy One at Sinai. We will not be doing so in Naso or in the book of the Midbar numbers in general. We will be getting ready to move. We will be in the desert. We will be in the wilderness. And so uh, that will become our proving ground. So uh, today, Parsha Naso, numbers 421 through 789, the longest Parsha of the Torah cycle, uh, it, it is going to be talking about what I call a prologue. To the proving ground narratives you know what's going if you read the torah if you've read the books you know what's coming next when we step out into the wilderness we leave sinai we leave this enclave uh, of the manifest presence we've had spent four and a half months in in, in uh, a foretaste of the messianic kingdom there's been peace in the camp and beauty and majesty and wisdom and downloads and we have been trained to, to reign and to bring forth life and health and peace, light and salt into the world. Oh, this has been a wonderful time. And now we're going to have to put it into practice. We're going to put sandal to the sand, uh, rubber to the road, as it may be, and see if what we have learned here is actually viable and doable and works in the real world and whether we're capable of carrying it and handling it, uh, capable today. We will be capable because we were made to be capable, but are we capable now? That's the question. So the prologue to the proving ground narrative. So what will happen in the book of Numbers? What experiences will we have? We know we, the thing is that the hunger, the murmurings, and the complainings, the lack, feeling of lack of water and of, and of food, and we want meat to eat, and we want like the melons and the cucumbers, but also the fish that came free to us in Egypt. We're gonna oh, then we're gonna face issues of well, can we really beat those Amorites, and can we really uh, take the land? Uh, it's going to be so dangerous, and the people are gonna tell us it's impossible, and they're too strong, and they're too fortified, and our our emotions are going to run wild, and then we're going to get all rebellious in mind. We're going to have want to have a new leader. We're not going to be satisfied with the leadership we've got. We want new leadership that'll do what we want, or that at least has a difference in its place. So then we're going to have a rebellion and Korach's rebellion, and then we're just going to get all sour and angry and mad at the Holy One and mad at all anyone He sends to us, uh, and just reject Him and go about our own way. We're going to. Uh, die in the desert, as, as it were. A whole generation will die in the desert because we just can't handle it. We will face enemies within, we'll face enemies without. This is the trials. This is the proving ground. Uh, the desert is where we learn what we're made of, 
what's in us and what was uh, not, what didn't take <laughs> whenever he, he had us at Sinai pouring into us. So, prologue to the proving ground narratives of the book of Numbers and the season of the wilderness. In this Parsha, in part of the next, in Beha'alotka, uh, in Naso and Beha'alotka, right before we leave Sinai, the Holy One is going to train us up. If you, uh, he's going to give us uh, instructions. He's going, to, he's going to teach us things that we are going to need to know. It won't seem to have any application when he tells them to us, but when we get in the desert and the things happen that happen in the desert, and our emotions go crazy, and our uh, jealousy arises, and our sense of, of boredom and complacency and wanting something more takes place and takes effect, and we get afraid and paranoid and angry and easily triggered by everything. When all that happens, this will make sense to us, but it may not make sense to us right now. The Holy One knows what we need, and He wants us to be prepared for everything that's coming. So, He will teach us things, things that we will be amazed at and say, was that ever going to have any application in my life? Uh, oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. He knows it will. Imagine if you were going to send your child uh, of 13 or 12, 14 years old and you had homeschooled all your life, all her life. You had kept them uh, trained up in the Torah and the wisdom of God. You had kept them away from foul uh, videos, language, uh, attitudes of people, you had to get raised them in an atmosphere of shalom in your home, uh, and, and now you were going to send them uh, on a trip uh, into uh, the real world. They were going to deal with other children their age, teenagers their age, and you, 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 they were going to deal with trials and, and, and stresses out of their out of the comfort zone, out of their support mechanism, out of their support group. They were going to deal with disorientation, confusion, things like that would happen to them, and they would be tempted in all sorts of ways, and they would be here easily irritable. And you knew they were going to do this, and you knew this was going to happen to them. You wouldn't just say, have a nice trip. You would teach them a few things that you thought they needed. You would give them some rooting and some grounding. You give us some, some strategies. Well, that's what the Holy One is going to do with us. Just take the picture away from you and your children if you're homeschooling uh, to sending them out in the world. Now it's the Holy One who has us at Sinai. We are His children. We are His beloved. We are His Am Segila, His Mamlachat. Kohani, his, his Goy Kadosh. We are his beloved ones and we are his representatives and his agents in his grand plan of redemption and restoration. And now he's going to have to send us out to face real trials in this real world. It's not going to be some uh, piece of cake. It's going to be, we're going to face the hardest and the difficult, most difficult terrain and people in the world. So, the Holy One's going to give us essential strategies that we will need we're going to successfully navigate the distractions, navigate the deceptions, navigate the temptations, navigate the fleshly appetite, affection, and emotion triggers that we are going to face in the wilderness season ahead. The proving ground narratives await us. What can he say to us to prepare us, to help us get ready for that? That's what we're going to talk about. In order to, to understand why this is so important, we sort of need to understand also where we are on the covenant calendar. So let's talk for a few minutes about the covenant calendar and where we are. As you may know and remember, it was just a week ago that we were all caught up in the throes of Shavuot and, and uh, we're remembering the, the, the time of strategic alignment when as we aligned, earth aligned with heaven and the people of the Holy One aligned with the holy heavenly host above and we connected in these beautiful ways, oh, we had things happen. We remember the, the falling of the, of, the, of the Torah, the tablets of the Torah, the coming down of the, of the, two, the two tablets of Torah. Remember the giving of, at Matan Torah and this new wonderful thing, this wisdom flow was opened on that day. We also remembered, or looked forward to at least, the, the, the download of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, that took place on the same day when heaven and earth aligned. And so we, we've just been empowered by Torah on the one hand, by the Holy Spirit on the other. Wow, are you conquering the world yet? <laughs> A week into this process, how are we doing on, on that? Realizing that's where we are, we're just a week away, a week past 
remembrance, recollection, realigning with that process, reconnecting with those great empowerments and downloads, Torah and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. We are also, however, six weeks before the next big event on the covenant calendar. That is the three weeks between the straits, and the dire straits season. It takes place between 17 Tammuz uh, on the fourth month and uh, ninth Ab on the fifth month. We have these three week period. Uh, a long story, I won't go into the great story, but the great trials and tribulations, the heaviest part of our tribulations of the year, and of course, uh, remembrance of the, of the fall of Jerusalem. And so we have the, on the one hand, we have this glorious giving of the Torah, the give, the remembrance of the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the full pouring out upon all flesh. And the, the next thing on our horizon is not pretty. It's three weeks between the Straits and the fall of Jerusalem, and the destruction and the diaspora, and the captivity and the bondage uh, of, of the of the exile. Well, yeah. and then we have uh, two and a half months, uh, a little bit further down the road than the three weeks. We have two and a half months. Uh, uh, before Elul, the month of the sixth month of the year, and the sixth month of the year, when we begin to turn back, we we process through the the raw the the, the trauma of what happened in the three weeks between the straits, the failure to exercise, the failure to implement the, the giving things that we received on of Torah and Ruach Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, back on Shavuot. We process through that. We turn back to the Holy One to the whole month of Elul. And the king is in the field, as it said, and our meditations come from, from Psalm 27. And then another month later, three and a half months away, is Yom Teruah, the day of the great blowing or breathing, blowing out of um, heaven. Again, we align with heaven again, and we pass beneath the great shepherd's rod for inspection. Uh, all these are coming. And then, of course, the following of the Yom Teruah uh, comes Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and we get back in sequence, back in alignment. Oh, but the long, hot summer, the, the, the uh, proving ground is what stands in between. Well, uh, from a standpoint of the, of the heavenly wallpaper that people read or the people of the covenant are learn, have learned to take on themselves, uh, in each season, we, we shifted whenever it's Shavuot, and we shifted away from Megillah Ruth, the book of Ruth, and now we have a new book. What is that? It's, it's the book of Jeremiah, Divrei Yirmiyahu. Uh, the book of Jeremiah is our wallpaper up to the three weeks, and in the beginning of the three weeks, that wallpaper changes to the book of Lamentations, both written by Yirmiyahu the prophet, called Jeremiah in the Western world. So I encourage you to start digging into the book of Jeremiah the prophet and begin to let that book be your wallpaper of life. Interpret the things going on in the world around you through the lens of the book of Jeremiah. All right, and we'll get ready to go into to Lamentations when the time comes for that. Now, that being the case as well, we have the Torah cycle, which is the, the essence, the, the, the script, the scroll out of which we live our lives day by day. Where are we in that Torah cycle? What is our, where are we on the road map where that leads us to life? Well, that's, we've just entered, or about to enter the proving grounds area, the proving ground narratives of the long hot summer, or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the long cold winter. The proving ground narratives await us, and that is what we're going to be in the throes of. And as we read these proving ground narratives, as we go through them and live them out week by week, in the next few weeks, we're going to remember, we're going to find out why it was that the Holy One brought us to Him on Shavuot, and gave us the Torah, and gave us the Holy Spirit. We are going to need them both very badly. These are our tools. These are our equipment to handle and to process and to navigate successfully through those things. But as we stand today, uh, still at Sinai, as we begin our, our narrative, our discussion in Parshanasa, we have been all been gloriously redeemed, right? We came out of Egypt again through the Red Sea and with all the different, we've been gloriously redeemed. We have been thoroughly now schooled in the Torah. We have been, we have daily bread and, and it's all 100% kosher. Yes, it is. This manna is all kosher. We have water for hydration and hydration hygiene needs. We we keep the Shabbat. We have around a bunch of people who keep the Shabbat. Everybody we know keeps the Shabbat. Oh, this is, we have the manifest presence oh, of the Holy One. 
in our camp, and in, in, in us, around us, with us, and, and, and we're with us. He's with us at all times, and in ways the previous generations and the patriarchs only could dream of. We have all these things: gloriously redeemed, thoroughly schooled in Torah, daily bread, 100% kosher, water for hydration and hygiene. We all keep Shabbat. We are not living in a world that doesn't keep Shabbat or doesn't do the kosher eating. We we have a manifest presence of the Holy One with us at all times in ways the previous generations only dreamed of. So. How do we not ace this life on earth thing with all this going for us, with all these things we have experienced and now uh, we could claim we possess? How could we not ace this? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Why are people telling us that in a few weeks we're going to be between the straits and the dire straits watching in awe and shock and awe as, as the city of Jerusalem is, is destroyed and, and people are sent out in captivity with hooks in their noses and ropes around their legs and their feet. How uh, to the Babylonians of the world and into the world, every area, every square inch of the earth as exiles, uh, how can we possibly not ace this with all the things we have been given, with the Torah, with the Holy Spirit, with all these other things? What could possibly go wrong? Huh? We're about to find out, dear ones. <laughs> We're about to find out. We're not alone. We're going through this together. And we all have to help each other, hopefully, to go through this and not lose the gifts, not misuse the gifts that we've been given, the, the training that we, have been, that we have received. We need to talk, though, uh, before we get too deep into this, about the effects of extended time in the desert. Ah, the desert plays tricks on the mind. It plays havoc on the body. It plays uh, havoc on the will of human beings and the, the will to live even of human beings. Uh, think about a uh, season of extreme sustained stress. Stress is a, a key word in today's society. We talk about it all the time. Nobody really knows what it means other than you know it when you feel it, right? You feel, I'm stressed, okay. What is stress? Stress is a sense that we are, have lost or are losing control of a situation. If we didn't worry about control, if we didn't worry about being in control, we wouldn't have stress. Stress is a factor of our sense of losing or having lost control. So, if you understand the difference between stress and muna or faith, trust in the Holy One, as it's often called, uh, then you, you kind of get the idea, stress being a fear that we're losing control, that we have lost control, that things are out of control. Ah, uh, now what is emunah? What is faith or trust? What is that? What is this thing? We could go into great detail about it and there's more complicated than this, but let me just basically say this. It is trust that the Holy One has everything in control. Hmm. Now you see the by dichotomy between us being stressed because we feel like we're losing control and the Holy One and teaching us trust and faith and Muna that says no it doesn't matter we're in, we don't need to be in control he is in control and therefore we don't get stressed because he is in control he is working all things together for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose he is working his plan he is planning his work he is working his plan and his plan is for the redemption of all mankind, bloodline by bloodline, family by family, household by household, as many as will come from, from the, 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 the curse of, of, the, of, the, of the sin in the world way, the fallen world's ways. And his plan is to restore creation to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom and uh, harmonious interaction. And he is working his plan. And he is working all things together for good. So, therefore, if that's the case, we should not be stressed. But in the desert, we fixate on the immediate. We fixate on the things. And we get overexposed to elements. We get overexposed to each other. We get overexposed to people. We get overexposed to leaders. We get overexposed to... Uh, our brothers and sisters, our, our neighbors, we get overexposed. And we also get in the process, our, our body temperature elevates 
that cause us to be on edge, nerves, short-tempered, quick-tempered, uh, quickly triggered by fear, by jealousy, by envy, by rage, by fight or flight response. We go into sensory overwhelm because we cannot really, and we never get comfortable, we're disoriented, we never feel like we're in the same place twice. Uh, everything keeps shifting, the sands keep shifting, the winds, the storms come, we can't control anything. This is the effects of extended time in the desert. What does it do to us? We, sh we were filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we, uh, we are schooled in Torah. We are given daily bread, but yet something else begins to take over the way our, our thinking. Our thinking turns away from the Holy One and His presence dwelling in our midst and His guidance and His plan, and we begin to focus on our own selfish uh, urge, our drive, our, 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 our instinct for survival. Survival obsession sets in. And, and that happens when the brain goes into sensory overload. Within our, it, the brain processes what our eyes see in strange ways. We start to see things because our, our brain tells us that they're there that are not there, that our eyes did not really see. Desert mirages, we begin to focus. We begin to imagine things then that are not true or that, that, we, or that are way beyond anything we have any real support for to believe. So we get jealous, we get envious, we get suspicious. And vain imaginations run rampant through our mind. Oh, you're, maybe if you know the Torah portion of what we're going to talk about, you may understand the, the sota, the whole issue of the sota. And we get, we get uh, since we need something more, we need more spirituality. We, we don't have enough. The Holy Spirit's not enough. The Torah is not enough. The presence, the manifest presence of the Holy One's not enough. The daily bread is not enough. We need more. So you get the whole idea of why he's going to talk to us about somebody they call the Nazir or Nazarite, as the English Bibles like to call them. And as these, all these things begin to take place, these random thoughts, these vain imaginations go through the mind, oh, then our, our whole flesh gets caught up in uncontrolled negative emotions. They come in waves. There's jealousy. There's rage. There's panic. There's fear. There's suspicion, paranoia. There's disorientation and confusion. There's easily susceptibility to deception. We're looking for something else to believe. We're looking for somebody else. To, we get dis satisfied with our leaders. We, we get dissatisfied with ourselves. We get dissatisfied with our neighbors. We, we look around, and they're all messed up. We see their faults. We begin to, to, comp, to, to complain, and criticize, and judge. And this all happens because of the extended time we spend in the desert. We should know better than this. We were given tools that keep us from this, but this doesn't happen. So what we do then is we sense we're losing control. And we are. <laughs> that is part of the game of the desert. We are actually supposed to lose control because we see we are the people of the Holy One. And we are called to let Him have control and to do His work, to do His will, to do it His way in His timing, to follow His instructions and follow His lead. And that means we lose control. So we're going to go through, as we sense the loss of control, we begin to experience and exhibit and uh, export fear and anger, depression, jealousy, envy, rage, arrogance. And this is, uh, I think it's interesting that, that the, this is called like Pride Month, but you know what pride means? Pride, and especially as it's used in the world today, every pride movement consists of this. Narcissistic arrogance. It's not pride, it's not a positive thing. It's narcissistic evidence. It is becoming a narcissist over a certain issue, whether it be a race issue, an ethnicity issue, a uh, gender uh, issue, uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of preference issue, some ideology issue, whatever it is that causes you to feel this, quote, pride is really just a form of narcissistic arrogance, toxicity to the rest of the world. You think you're better or more entitled than they are, and they are worse and more de deserving of, of punishment or of mockery than others. That's, uh, that is called narcissistic arrogance, not pride. <laughs> so, but we need to remember what the wilderness is all about, what the wilderness experience we're going through is all about. 
Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 3, Moshe summarizes the desert experience, Zaman, the Midbar, the times in the wilderness. And he says, remember that the Holy One, your God, led you all the way these 40 years in the desert, the Midbar. He did it to humble you. He did it to test you. Remember I talked about losing control. I talked about letting him be in control. And to test you as to what? To reveal what was in your heart. And he said, I did it to humble you and to test you to reveal what was in your heart, and specifically to reveal whether you would keep, treasure, cherish, guard, and then walk in his mitzvot, his instructions, or not. That's what you're in the desert for, to learn whether you will or will not follow his instructions. So he humbled you, it said, Moshe says, and he allowed you to hunger, yes, and he fed you with manna that you did not know, that your fathers did not know, in order that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, food alone. But man is to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the whole. The mouth, the words that proceed from the mouth of the whole are not just nice things to think about. They're our life. That's where we, how we live. We live by those words. We are empowered by those words. And we take in, drink in the spirit of those words as well as the, the, the text of those words. So over the next weeks, beloved, I have warned you, as the desert narrative begins to full underflow, we begin to live out of this book of Numbers, you will find that you are experiencing unexpected, perhaps certainly unprovoked attacks on your shalom, on your peace, on your sense of well-being, on your sense of calm, on your sense of purpose and destiny, and yes, control. Attacks on your shalom. Challenges to your emunah, challenges to your trust in the Holy One to have everything under control. There will be news, there will be situations arise, there will be confrontations you deal with, there will be scenarios that will trigger extreme emotion in you. Well, you thought those things were under control, you thought that was not going to happen, but then the circumstances get tough, the heat is on, as it said, and suddenly you worry about things you didn't think you had to worry about. Things You worry about deprivation in food areas. areas what will we eat? Will, do we have enough in our cupboard? Do we have enough buried? Do we have enough hidden away, stocked away? Do we have supplies for a storm or for a war or for an apocalypse? Oh, we worry about deprivation of food and water. And do we have adequate clothing? Or do we have shelter? Do we look right? Do we feel right? Do we recover? Do we protect? Do we have protection? Do we have an army? Do we have guns? Do we have weapons? Do we have, do we have enough to protect ourselves and protect what's ours? Oh, do we, and do we have enough, uh, are we close enough to our companions? Do we trust our companions to give us the support and to be on it with us and to, to be, have our back? Oh, these are the issues we start worrying about. We thought those were taken care of, but suddenly in the heat of the summer, in the heat of the desert, they did not. We begin to face and deal with and worry about and then have to face physical and verbal aggression and bullying by the rest of the world. The world does not get the peace and the shalom of the Holy One. It doesn't have that to work with. So therefore, they resort to, to very different. And in the summertime, in the heat, in the stress-generating times, they've experienced that as well. They just have no coping mechanisms whatsoever other than their own wits. And believe me, that's not very good. Common sense does not get you anywhere. And certainly indoctrination and ideologies and um, movements and politics is never going to help you solve any problem of any significance. So they resort to what they know, physical and verbal aggression and bullying. They can't, they want, that's, that's how they exhibit control. And then you face what happens is even in, within your own people, your own groups, you face interpersonal drama. Uh, rejection happens. Yes, yes, it will happen to you. Betrayal will happen to you. Abandonment, you will sense it at least, if, or fear it, even if it does not happen. Bereavement will happen to you. Bereavement will happen in the camp. You will at times feel unworthy and insecure in your own self. This will hit you in your, in your own self of awareness, your own self-consciousness, and in your areas, and then and faith will, will begin to flee, but your, your sense of your own importance, and yet no one's recognition of that will hit. You will feel excluded, you will feel ignored, you will feel disapproved, 
you'll feel disrespected. You'll feel like you're being, and you may be being made fun of, mocked. You will hear, be labeled slime. People will call you things and use labels, derogatory labels uh, that they apply to you. You'll be called a, a racist. You'll be called a, a Nazi. You'll be called a fascist. You'll be called whatever they want to call you, who are a group you're in. They, like, they have their label slimy mechanisms. And that's all it is. Understand it's just label slimy. It doesn't define who you are. Even in their own eyes, they just like to label slime because it gives them a sense of control. Okay, so if they label slime you, you have to respond to the label slime they think. But you don't. <laughs> but you don't. So they label slime you. And they, they, they take whatever labels you choose to use. And I suggest you be careful about choosing any labels that you will apply to yourself. Any titles, any categories. Because they'll take whatever label you put on yourself or any title you give you. And they're going to twist the meaning of that. And they're going to make you doubt that you even know what you are talking about and they're gonna make everybody else think you don't know what you're talking about uh, or that those labels are negative as opposed to positive okay so now you get the idea this is coming this is the summer this is the season in the wilderness uh, so after you get label slimed and have your own labels that, that were positive redefined <laughs> rewritten for you the script rewritten that you'll be accused of wrongdoing and of perversion of sickness and of being the problem with the world you'll be gaslighted okay are you ready this is what this is why we have a little trouble holding on to the things of the Torah and the things of the Holy Spirit because this is the world we live in and the season we are in you will feel unwanted by the world, and you will be. You will feel unloved even by some of your own closest friends because they're going through all this stuff too. And it's hard. It's hard to hold fast and hold straight to love whenever you're being under attack like this. You'll feel unappreciated, and you may be. But you know what? No one owes you anything. Every breath of life is a precious gift from the Holy One. Let us give thanks for that. And if anyone else does anything if he even gives us the time of day or speaks to us and says hello, let us thank the Holy One for that, not complain that that wasn't enough. Okay, we will feel misunderstood and we will be. And we may misunderstand ourselves and we will certainly misunderstand others. Sometimes we will feel smothered. Sometimes we'll feel trapped. Sometimes we'll feel exposed. And at all times we'll feel like we're being manipulated and controlled. That could go wrong. That's what could go wrong. This battery of tests is coming. And the question that all these things that we're going to face poses to us is now, knowing what we're about to face, can we step into it responsibly? And in the course of walking through these trials and tribulations, in this world, you will have tribulation. In the course of doing that, facing that tribulation, can we, will we, steward and nurture it? the precious gifts that we have received from our King, or will we not? What are those precious gifts? Ah, there's so many. But first and foremost is the Torah, the precious gifts of His instruction manual for life on earth. How to process, how to stay focused, how to keep going forward instead of getting caught up in blame and, and anger and hate and despair. Torah is the way forward. So the precious gift, can we nurture it? Can we steward it? Can we treat it with the respect and walk in it with the honesty that he tells us? And the second gift, precious gift, so many. But we'll use uh, this, what I'll, I'll combine the words tabernacle, shekinah, or shekinah, and ruach, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's manifest presence. We have the Torah as his written word, as his instructions, as words of life, and we have the presence that goes with those words. You can call it tabernacle, you can call it Shekinah, you can call it Ruach, you can call it Holy Spirit, but it is the manifest presence of the Holy One actually empowering the words and awakening our, those words in our spirit and giving us direction as to how to apply what. That, we have these precious gifts, can we nurture and steward them? Realizing this, that unlike most religions may teach or most uh, people may want to believe, the Torah and the Holy Spirit and Ruach and the presence of the Holy One, Methodist presence, are not our personal property. They are not ours to do with as we wish. They're not our assets. They are kingdom assets. They are tools. They are weapons issued on loan uh, by a higher power, by the Holy One to us. They're given to us 
only for strategic purposes that further the grand plan of the Holy One of redemption and restoration. Uh, further the mission that we are assigned, our particular tribe and plan uh, is assigned, and further the assignments that each one of us individually has been given. These are not our personal property. The Torah is not ours to use as we see fit and throw around as we desire. Uh, the tabernacle or the Shekinah, Shekinah, the presence, the, the, the Ruach, the Holy Spirit is not ours to play with and to do with and feel like we're super empowered. Now, super, we have superpower by virtue of that. That is not what the Torah or the Holy Spirit are about. These, are, these assets of the kingdom are to be kept clean like a gun given to a soldier. To have clean, kept in the proper place, maintained in proper place according to proper protocol, handled with extreme care for the purposes and returned back without being uh, in any way misused. We are to use the tools of the Torah and the Holy Spirit only as and for the purposes we have been trained and we have been assigned to use them and not otherwise. We don't get to do with them whatever we want. We don't get to use them for our own selfish purposes. We don't get to use them for our will being done or our sense of control being done. We use them only as we were trained at Sinai to use them. That means the Torah, and that means the Holy Spirit is subject to the Torah, and the Torah is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Or it won't work. It won't work. You'll get Torah terrorists out there, or you'll get Holy Spirit freaks out there. These things must coincide. This is the plan must use, we must employ, we must work with the tools that were given to us as we have been trained to do so. No training in proper use, no submission to that training, no learning from that training, no submission to the rules of engagement, no right to use. So, the wilderness looms before us. Image bearers, we as his image bearers are about to be deployed into this real world of real troubles and real trials and real stresses. Are our hearts ready for the challenge? Have we gotten our families and our hearths ready for the challenge? Uh, well, the Shem, the name, the, the title, the, the designation, the essence of this week's Parsha is called Naso. It means to lift up. Lift up. And the, the next word is going to be Erosh, lift up the head. The idea of the whole part is you're going to look look ahead, lift up your head. We need to be people of the uplifted head, not so. Our challenge as we face all the, the trials of the wilderness, as we, the proving ground, uh, the testing ground, as we go into this, our challenge will be to get and embrace, first of all, our sense of placement in the grand plan. We. Uh, the grand plan is what this world and what our lives are all about. His plan for the redemption of mankind as a species, bloodline by bloodline, household by household, family by family, individual by individual, as many as will come. That is step one. Step two being, and in the course of doing so, the grand plan is for the restoration of all creation, hillside by, and valley, river and mountain, uh, desert and, and, uh, and forest, and everywhere in between to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom and harmonious interaction and interface with humanity. This is what the grand plan is and nothing else that we see. All the survival issues that we deal with, all the, the, the interpersonal drama issues we deal with must be viewed through the lens and, and, uh, and responded to in connection with the grand plan and consistent with the grand plan. So we will have a bloodline assignment, we have a personal assignment, we have a personal task. And the idea is to stay focused in the midst of all the trials, tribulations, and tests on the mission, on the divine agenda, on the, on the directions of the Holy One, on the impetus of His Spirit. Even when we have to deal with things like spiking fleshly emotions, confusion, disorientation, uh, hunger, desire, hormonal urge and appetite and interpersonal dramas. The Holy One therefore is about to give us a series of instructions in Naso for dealing with what he considers the greatest challenge to our one new man identity, our Adam Chadash Echad identity, our baseline person. He wants us not to sabotage the operation of the grand plan of redemption and restoration. 
We have been given a season in our lifetime, in our generation, uh, to, to, to have spheres of influence in which we are to bring forth the grand plan and our, do our part in the grand plan. He doesn't want us to be saboteurs instead. Uh, now, when we lift our head, Naso begins to say, we lift the head. And particularly he's going to, the Holy One's talking, and he's going to be telling Moshe to lift the head. First of, of the descendants of Gershon, who is one of the clans of, uh, of the tribe of Levi. And then he's going to go later and to, and to lift up the head also of the, of the head of Merari, the, the, the other clan, the third clan of the, uh, of the tribe of Levi. This is going to focus on Levi, but they're just examples. They're just models for us. Lift up your head as well. He, well the Holy One wants us to be uh, empowered by Torah and His Holy Spirit to keep our head uplifted above the fray, above the things that are immediate, that are threatening survival, that are threatening lack of control, to uh, personal control, I mean, to, to the greater plan. So, lifting the head. The head is the portal of vision, uh, the, the, the portal or vessel of perspective, and it is the home of our thought matrix. When it is elevated, when our head is uplifted, our whole life comes with it. Lifting our head increases and improves our level of consciousness and awareness. It improves our mood and our attitude. When we lift our head, that's why he says, be not, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why is our face fallen? If you, you need to lift the head. So before we start anything else, the Holy One begins the instructions for us in this time to get us ready. Learn how to live Keep your head lifted, and when your head falls, when you let him be the lifter of your head, their glory and the lifter of your head. This is step one, critical phase number one in facing and, and surviving and prospering in the wilderness. So the lifting of the head raises the level of consciousness, improves our perspective, improves our mood and our attitude, improves the quality and of our speech, improves the 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 tone of our voice and the ability of other people to hear us when we're depressed, when we're angry, when we are downcast, people cannot hear us. And if they hear us, they misunderstand us. And if they don't misunderstand us, they don't want to hear what we have to say. Why would they? So lifting the head has to do everything to do with the way in which we approach life and the way people will approach us. It has to do even with our behavior. That being said, we have just a few more minutes, but it's not for sake to do our call to worship our Baraku. Would you sing with me if you know it? Otherwise, you can just enjoy the Hebrew wafting through the air, airwaves over your heart and over into your life. Baraku Adonai Amvorak Baruch Adonai Amvorak Leolam Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haulam, Asher bachar banu mechol ha'amin, Benatalanu et toratu. Baruch ata Adonai, Noten ha'torah. And may now open our eyes, O Holy One, that we may see wondrous things in your Torah, for we are but strangers in the earth, so do not hide your commandments from us. The closing lines of last week's Parsha of Bamidbar, where is this? The Holy One speaking to Moshe and Aaron, he says, you are not to cause the Kahati family, the first clan of the Levites, uh, to, uh, to be cut off from the rest of the tribe. Do this so that they may live the Kehati. And do not die when they enter the holiest things in the holiest places. Aaron and his sons are to come and put everything in order and arrangement. Ish Ish al obo do avo ish ish al obo da tu ve al masa o. Each man who may faithfully perform his his service, his servanthood, and his tasks. Velo yava o li rod kivara 
at HaKodesh Ve'amita. And you, they are to go in, and not go in, rather. They are not to go in and look at the holy things while they are being covered and die. This is the Kahati. Learn what's holy and what's not, and how to approach it and use protocols. That was where we ended last week. This week it begins as follows in Numbers 4, 21. And the Holy One spoke to Moshe, saying, Lift up the head of B'nai Gershon, the sons of Gershon, the descendants of Gershon. And with also with them, their father's house and their families. Uh, ben Hamashim Shana. From 30 years up to 50 years up, these men, Tifkod Otam, you are to visit them, you are to inspect them, you are to muster them, and you are to take an accounting of them. This is what we're doing. Bullet points for the Parsha would include the following Tasks are assigned. A mission, a grand plan is afoot. A mission is in process and tasks are being assigned. Do you know your task? Do you know the sphere of influence you've been assigned to impact and that you have the most impact in? Are you wasting your time working in other spheres of influence, trying to take over somebody else's sphere of influence assignment? Are you doing what you're called to do, what you do well? Are you focusing on that? Are you trying to do too much, too little, too, too, something else? Are you trying to, to fit in with the world? Are you trying to be popular? Are you trying to build a ministry? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your energy and with your time? What are you doing with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Torah and the wisdom of instruction that he's given to you? What are you doing with it? What task are you engaging in? With, to what purpose? In whose honor and whose glory? The second thing is to, to learn how to keep things clean. Tohor. Uh, whole without being uh, diminished or depleted or in any way uh, diluted by the by uh, joinder with the world. Keep the holy things holy. Um, give them be an example, a model, but not be polluted and corrupt by uh, joining them with things of the world. You're letting human uh, ideas, organizational theories, and, and protocols, and, and institutional thinking infect the holy things. Let the holy things be the holy things. And uh, not let our kingdom assignments and spheres of influence be polluted through us spreading this unclean things of the world. The, the wisdom, the instruction, the, the ideas, the, the theories, the ideologies, the politics of the world, and bringing that into our world. Into the holy things. Ah, are we are we are we are we at shalom? Is our spirit at shalom? Are we content with him being in control? Are we is Emunah flowing us? Do we trust that he is working all things together for good? Are is Simcha, is joy arising up out of us? Do we have a well of joy? And are we able to tap into it on a moment of or have we gotten into sadness, depression, anger, anxiety, worry, stress? What are is Simcha our our, our primary state? Our our center of gravity, or, or how about how about tikva, joy, uh, hope? Uh, are we full of hope, or are we full of sadness, despair? Are we looking at trends and saying this is they can't work out well, things are going to go bad? Are we talking about are we, are we letting our mouths say things about how negative the world is, or individual people are, or the culture is? Or are we doing that, or are we letting tikva about what the whole one can do with it if we, if we just work with him? Uh, are we are we are we uh, giving testimony of good news or are we giving testimony of horrible news? All right, there are going to be extremes of interpersonal drama and emotion. You have to get ready for them. Expect them. Do not be shocked by them. Do not think this is somehow uh, something you can't overcome. Don't take, a, don't take a victim mode. Don't feel like it's unjust. This is part of learning and training. In, of the kingdom people to deal with these things, injustices, uh, inequities, inequalities. This is not something to mount a, a, an offensive or a war over. This is something, or to get arrogant, uh, narcissistically arrogant uh, on behalf of a culture or a people or a class or anything. That This is not that. This is merely a, the test. Will we follow the words and the ways? 
but we walk in the, in the wisdom of the Holy One or not. All right. So, with that being said, let's briefly talk about what's going to happen in Parsha now. So, and then I'll let you read it all and study it and meditate on it and discuss it all by yourselves the rest of this beautiful Sabbath day. The first thing that uh, the, the book of Naso, the Parsha Naso has is assignments particular to the family of, and the bloodline of Gershon, of the clan of Gershon, of the tribe of Levi. That, don't, don't get distracted by the fact that you don't carry uh, tapestries, <laughs> or you, in this case you don't carry, you don't carry around parts of the tabernacle. You don't carry around the, the framework or the, or the sockets or the tent pegs or the or the rope that you use as guy wires. You don't you don't physically do that, so you might be tempted to just throw it away, say it's not meaningful. But the assignments to the Gershon even say everybody has a task. Everybody is part working together. We can't and none of us can do it alone. We're no lone rangers. We're part of a group, we're part of a whole kingdom that has assigned task. Let everyone else do their task, you focus on doing the task assigned to you. Then the next thing is the assignments of the family of Blood Marari. They're the ones who obviously carry the tapestries, the curtains, the veils. They take care of them. They're not just carrying them one from place to place. They're responsible for being taken care of them, make sure they're kept safe from elements, uh, kept clean, kept pure, kept usable, uh, maintaining uh, them in all that regards. We have maintenance responsibilities as well. We have have purity responsibilities as well. Are you fulfilling your purity and your maintenance responsibilities? Are you stewarding what has been given to you? And being a good steward of those things, both things that are internal like emotions and, and uh, appetites and urges. Are you stewarding them? Are you stewarding also the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Torah and the gifts of all the things that you've learned? Then we have a season of discussion of numbering the tribe of Levi and its clans, uh, we're all part of something bigger. One nation, one God, not a one. We are, though we are clans, though we have many tribes, many clans, we are one nation with one joined common purpose, one common plan, one common mission. So that is part of the issue. And then we deal with issues of separation. Uh, if we're going to have a holy camp, then we need to understand that sometimes stuff's gonna happen in our camp. That's, Three things: zarat, uh, zuvim, uh, discharges. We have this, this skin eruptions. Uh, then you have uh, flesh eruptions of the uh, uh, discharges. Uh, and then you, and you have the other issue of what's in in, in English it just looks like you know, being contaminated by the dead by contact with the death. It really isn't death when you look at in the Hebrew. It's the nefesh. It's contact with people who are flowing toxic with their emotions and not, control, not keeping them under control. But those three things, when you're, we're contaminated by that, when we're being influenced more by that than by the words of the Holy One, then we need to have a time outside the camp. We need to have a time of clarity, a time when we're not uh, releasing our toxicity in the world, but we're processing our toxicity through psalmistry discussions with the Holy One. Well, then there's that. And he says, now they're be restored to the camp. The next thing is uh, the protocols for restoration of a covenant breaker. Uh, if we break covenant, there's two things, basically, that he says to three things, actually. Two, one first thing is that we are to confess. Uh, we are to, and the, and the word comes from, it's a form of yada. We're to acknowledge. It's about knowing. It's about understanding. It's about appreciating. It's about being uh, conscious and aware that we have broken covenant. And then speaking it, expressing it, discussing it rationally, discussing it calmly, discussing it from the standpoint of understanding how serious it is and how sorry we are for it. And then the issue becomes making restitution, adding 20%, one fifth, adding a portion, saying this is how, we know how serious it was, more than the damages we've caused or the injury we've, we've inflicted or the things that we've taken that belong to you. We want to give you back something to, to, to let you know that we are fully remorseful uh, and, and penitent about this. And we don't want to do it again, so we're going to make it uh, where you understand that. We want to make a, a, an offer, a gesture to heal and restore the relationship. And then we have this, the instructions that are given in the Torah about the sota, the uh, suspected adulteress. Why, with as much as is going on in the wilderness, are we worried about our, our spouses or our lovers uh, having other uh, 
why are we so why are we getting, getting into suspicion, envy, and jealousy? Uh, you see, the emotions are rampant. We're not thinking clearly. We're not responding. We're not staying focused on what's important. Uh, the issue is not what the adulteress did wrong. It's why is this even an issue in our camp? <laughs> why is this an issue in our camp? What went wrong? So we have a specific strategy that the Holy One gives us, and it, you won't like the strategy. You shouldn't, because this is not something that we can ever see happen in our camp. Then we have the, the issues of a Nazarite vow. We're going to, okay, the Nazir, the, this idea of I'm going to separate myself from the rest of you and make me vow. I want to be super spiritual for a while. And some have different ideas about what this means, but why do we need something like this? Why would a person feel they need to do something beyond the Torah and follow the impetus of the Holy Spirit? Why would we do something besides do our task and our assignment? There's a, a call, there's an urge in caverns in the wilderness that we want to be super spiritual. We want to, we're going to get out of our rut, our complacency. We want to do something, to, uh, and that's very personal, very selfish, very selfish or self-centered. But uh, there's a problem. If you want to do that, he says, I'm not telling anybody to do that. Nobody is being told to make a Nazarite vow. But if you feel like you need to do something extra special, follow these protocols. And they'll probably uh, do some, something good will happen if you follow these protocols, if that's what you want to do. And he introduces the ironic blessing, the actual phrasing of the ironic blessing. Oh, in the later part of chapter 6, it is so beautiful to understand that we will need, we will want, we will crave, our souls are crave. Even in the midst of having the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of having the Torah, even in the midst of having a companion, a nation around us, and people, and a task, and an assignment, and a purpose for being alive, we need something. Well, what we really need is not to be a Nazarite, probably. It needs to, we, we really need this to, to receive and embrace the ironic blessing. May the Holy One bless you and keep you and make His face shine upon you and give, be gracious to you, give favor to you. May the Holy One lift up His countenance, His presence be upon you, and may He give you health, provision, protection, welfare, wholeness, wellness, joy, hope, and peace. Yes. And finally, the last part of the partial will be the strange phenomenon of 88 verses in which we find out that all over the camp there's been a stirring tribe by tribe, to desire to, to give something, to contribute something to this great journey we're about to begin. And so there's going to be cooperation between tribes, fellow neighboring tribes, and then individuals. And what we're going to find out is, though no communication, no, uh, none of that stuff happened, we all bring the same things. This is when the Spirit moves. We work in unity. We don't do things differently because we're this house or that house or this clan or that clan or this tribe or that tribe. We follow the leading of the Spirit and it all looks exactly the same. So 88 verses we gave to each of the 12 tribes brings forth exactly the same things without coordinating the efforts. It just happens. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. Finally, we'll finish verse 89, chapter 7. The Holy One will give us a paradigm for communicating. He's going to mention a uh, motion. But what he's going to say is, whenever Moshe went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, with the Holy One, he would hear all of his words coming from the mercy seat, the covenant, the one that was on the ark of the testimony between the two cherubim. He would speak to him, the Holy One would speak to Moshe. So, beloved, the presence of the Holy One being with us and the voice of the Holy One speaking to us are the key to survival in the wilderness. They are the key, the protocols of getting through and surviving and flourishing in the desert and fulfilling the purposes and the mission for which we were born. It's time for me to leave you now. If you haven't had a chance to do so yet, please drop your name, your location in the comments section. Let me know whatever you're thinking, whatever's going on with you. Bless you. Thank you for joining me. Let me join you. Shabbat. Shalom.